No, did Australia they, isn't. Did they know you were Catholic? Uh, they, they did. Okay. They did. They did. Or some of them did. Maybe not all of them, because I was very discreet. And at that time, I didn't, wouldn't wear a cross uh, because uh, I, I, I wasn't quite sure of the reception I'd get. So I was perhaps, I'm ashamed to say, too discreet. Uh, however, um, this gave me an opportunity to, to meet with other people and this is how I met my husband who was, it was his first posting, he worked for the Swedish Foreign Office and he was working at the Swedish Embassy in Karachi and I met him there. And when you came back, did your, did your father try to challenge your no, decision? No, they didn't. They, okay. it, it, we, it was just, we never talked about it. Oh. I could take a, a taxi or a rickshaw to to Mass every Sunday and nobody asked me any questions that my parents knew I was going there. And in fact, my first date with my husband was he came to pick me up and take me to church. I met him on a Sunday party on Saturday and he found out I was a Catholic, interested him because he was a Lutheran. And uh, he said, oh, he was a Swede. He was a Swede. <laughs> and he said, okay, I'll take you to Mass because he was curious about Catholic Mass. So that was our first date, was a mass at, uh, <laughs> at the cathedral. Little did he know, right? Right, little did he know. And then about, uh, we were very, you know, we decided very quickly that we were going to marry, I think after just six months. But my husband in the meantime had been transferred to, to Holland. And when I told my parents that I wanted to marry a Swede, oh, hell broke loose again. Because I think my parents had always hoped that I would marry a Muslim and then I would reconvert, come back here. Yeah. And when that did not happen, they realized that it would not happen, so they were very, very sad. So I had a second rupture with my parents. I again had to leave home. My, my parents tried to, uh, you know, really almost blackmail my husband from backing off, and uh, which I was very upset over because I thought that they, 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 it was not, they shouldn't have done that. And with that, then I left again, and I, uh, and I, and I, and I came back to Europe. And eventually, my husband and I we married in 1965, and uh, then for the next four years, I had no. No contact. No contact with my parents because they were very upset with me and. Uh, but I continued with my brother and through some of my friends I was able to keep in touch with them, although kind of not, not directly. And then an uncle of mine died, my mother's brother, and I went to London for his, uh, when he was in hospital there, and that bridged. Because I always felt great affection for my family, and I know that they felt it for me too, although they were a little bit angry with me for what I had done. Probably awkward not knowing what to do. In what they saw as rebellion, but also a different world. I mean, the yeah. Muslim world yes. and to try yes. to understand yes. the Catholic world. No, they, they, it was very hard for them to understand that. And of course, they, they perhaps thought it out that I was rejecting them in some way. That is why it was so important for me to keep my name, because I thought that otherwise they'd think that I had, you know, not only, I'd rejected my name, I'd rejected my culture, I'd rejected it. And I'd, I'd, I've really never done that, at least not in my heart. I, I've always being very proud to be a Pakistani and I'm very grateful to them for my faith so it's, it, it has never been a rejection from my part but I can see that they might have thought that but anyway then with my husband we, we got married of course we dare not tell anybody that we were getting married we had nobody at our wedding two witnesses from my husband's office and that was it <laughs> we married in Holland and uh, there you have to have these civil wedding first and then a religious wedding so we had that in Holland, and um, was it the, a Catholic or a Lutheran? My, no, no, no. It was a Catholic wedding. Oh, okay. in those days, they still had to sign, you know, that their children would be brought up Catholic and so on. I don't think they do it anymore. But uh, this is pre. No, this is not pre-Vatican. But still, they hadn't. I don't think they had yeah. changed those rules then. Well, they pretty much still accept it. But was, was your husband at the time showing any interest? You see, for me, the most important thing about marrying my husband was I didn't. I I I, I would never have married a Muslim. That I would not have done. And I would not have married somebody who did not support me in my values and in my faith. That was the most... He didn't have to be a Catholic, but he had to not to be against it. Because I, I don't think I would have been interested in somebody who was... Uh, who was Set against it. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Matter, no, no, the, the, no. it had to be. And, and that has been my principle even with my daughters. I've always advised them and they were dating that please don't marry somebody who is 
doesn't share your values and I'm very happy that they both <laughs> married very good men. So my, my husband, he was very uh, attracted to Catholicism. He, was, um, he, he, he always follow, came to church with me and he was a great support the first 16 years of our marriage when he was not a Catholic but he came. In fact, in the end our daughters were telling him, why don't you become a Catholic? You're more Catholic than Mama. <laughs> So when we were stationed in Tokyo, he, he finally became a Catholic. He, he was received into the church there he in 1980. Was stationed. I'm sorry, I forgot. What, what did your husband do? He was, he was working for the Swedish Foreign Office. Okay. So we, we, we lived in Algeria, in Holland, in Italy, in Poland. And we finally ended. So yes. You've lived in lots of places. Lots of places, yes. And then we were in, in, in uh, Tokyo for five and a half years. And there we belonged to a parish that was run by the uh, American Franciscans from the Holy Name uh, Province, New York. And they had this chapel center in, in Tokyo, in Rapongi, very close to where we lived. And that became our second home. And our daughters, I'm very happy to say, their real first experience of being in a Catholic milieu was at that chapel center which was very warm very welcoming and uh, we had a great time and they, they 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 have never ever not wanted to be catholic either you know so it's been a very good for, for us it was a wonderful place i'm very grateful to the americans for their warm um, catholicism that and the people that i met there at that chapel center they were mostly americans who came there but um, at the time when we were there most of your journey has been about your discovering of the faith. Mm. So in many ways it's what you've been receiving mm. and after becoming Catholic, coming home, did you yourself get involved? Oh yes, I, I became involved already when we were living in Tokyo. Um, I started to go to retreats and all kinds of um, uh, courses and so on to deepen my faith because I really wanted to do that and, and because it, everything was in English. Before we know we lived in non-English speaking countries so there was a handicap there yeah. to get into the parish life of these places that we lived in. It was difficult in Poland, it was difficult in Italy and Algeria and so on. So, but when we came to this English speaking community it really blossomed for me. And when, then when we returned to Sweden I got immediately, I, I had already started to teach catechism in, in, uh, for the lower grades in, in, in Tokyo. But when we came back here, I got involved in the, in the, in the parish here. I go to Santa Eugenia's parish here, which is a Jesuit-run parish. And um, after a while, somebody asked me to take over the, to be responsible for the English-speaking group there. And so we started a catechism there for the English-speaking group. And I'm very involved there. And I teach uh, catechism to uh, children who are between 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. It's kind of a mixed group and because I'm not uh, preparing them for a sacrament for the post first Holy Communion, I, 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 I'm trying to teach them to pray so we do a lot of sharing and praying together and also I try to get them to think about their faith. You know, I, ask them questions and I invite them to so that we don't follow any course material anymore with just discussion and trying to get them to take up yeah. abortion um, take their oh, 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 yeah, all kinds of things like that so that they start because I think that that's, it, it, there's been a problem with catechesis in, 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 in the, I, I saw it in my daughters they unfortunately did not receive very good um, catechesis. Well, they were living in these different countries. Dif yes, right? yes. And, but you know, it was the, the materials. When I look back at those books that I, they received, my gosh, it was really awful much stuff. I don't know how anybody stayed Catholic with that. And I think maybe you can see the result in, 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 in many countries that people my age and my children's age are not, not very well catechized. But, but thank God that's changing. I see new books coming out that are much better. Right. But, um, th but there is a lost generation there. Well, you know, I think not because of what was in the council, but because of how people 
misinterpreted, yes, misapplied, yes, yes, ran yes, the council yes, during yes, a time of yes, people yes, not sure. Yes. No, no, it's not the council's huh? fault. Absolutely not. No, but it's the way it was interpreted. Absolutely. And, you know, the, when I look at the first communion material, it's just absolutely appalling. It really is. So we've had to change all that gradually. Of course, we don't have the resources here either because, you know, everything has. But because I uh, teach in the English group, we are very lucky. We can get a lot of stuff from from the United States, from England, and also from the internet. It's just fantastic what is available now. Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely very happy to live nowadays. <laughs> so you said your husband came in when you were in Tokyo. Yes, yes. After we were married 16 years, he became a Catholic, and so now we are a, a totally Catholic family. And. Uh, our two daughters, one of them, she's she married a Catholic, and the other one, she's married to a Lutheran, but um, he totally supports her in her, in her faith. And, uh, what are your thoughts on, in your lifetime, there's been a lot of changes in the relationship between the Islam, Islamic world and, and the West, and we really see it now, and for many, in many ways, those of us that have no direct contact with the Islamic world, we're seeing it only through the news and, mm-hmm. and what we're seeing. But, yeah. but you've lived it, obviously. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, you know, it's like with any faith, there are good and bad people, you know, sure. extremists and uh, moderates and, you know, on all sides. But what I do think that I'm very, personally, I was very happy with Pope Benedict that he <laughs> said that we have to have a, a reciprocity. I think that is absolutely important. I think uh, I, I think I, I can't understand why anybody should take offence over that. That there should be freedom of uh, expression, from that you freedom of religion. I mean, for me, yeah. it's absolutely vital. I mean, I, do, I I can't see how I could live in Pakistan if it if it wasn't. I, I, I do not understand the, the, the uh, commotion that was caused because the Pope uh, baptized a, a, a Muslim at, at the Easter liturgy. Choice. I mean, it was his choice. He's a 56-year-old man, I think he was. I mean, we, how can you force people a go, to go against their conscience? I mean... Yeah, I've wondered, and I may be completely wrong on this, but I've often wondered when you have a whole... Um, country or area that refuses freedom to others mm. it almost makes me wonder whether it's because down deep they're insecure about their own mm. I think I think that is the reason absolutely they're, they're afraid they're gonna yes. uh, that yes. what they believe is going and to then be there's certain out. firebrands who you know ignite a, you know yeah. the, the, the others you know to do that but most people like everywhere I mean they're not very well informed about their faith I'm sad to say that we Catholics are are the same. <laughs> Many of us don't really bother to to deepen our our, our, our knowledge and our faith uh, either. So I mean, I'm not pointing fingers at the Muslims, but yeah. but it is like that. But unfortunately, there are ruthless people who who uh, incite take, others. And some of those very radicals take their faith. They're taking their faith very seriously. I wonder if they are. Well, that's that's a good point. <laughs> are they, or they're taking it? Either they're taking it so seriously, but not guided well, so yeah, they're yeah. off base. I mean, I know fundamentalist Christians that yeah. unguided can become very radical, right? Or they're using their faith for their yeah, own. That's right. Benefit. I think very often it's that, you know, because when one has to have a humility uh, about it, and and and, uh, and at least give the other person the benefit of the doubt, you know. How can anybody go into anybody's heart and say that you're, you know, you should be this or that? <laughs> I mean, in the end, you know, we all have to make make the decision. And then, I mean, I I used to tell my father, I said, okay, maybe heaven, I'll find out that it it's Muslim. <laughs> but okay, you know, I did it out of sincerity, and God can hardly, if He's a merciful God, as Islam says He is, how can He punish me for that? You know. I'm, if you're sincere, and I said it might be the other way around too, you know, you might find that he's a Catholic God after all. <laughs> yeah. well, that's, that's, that's the way we have ecumenical dialogue. Right. right, you know, well, how can, I mean, you can't, we have to be open and we have right. to be tolerant and we have to at least respect each other's... Uh, yeah. Of course, well, the reason we're having a program like this is because we really do want everyone to come home to the fullness. I mean, that's, absolutely, that, that is absolutely. Our absolute yeah, desire. for me, there is nothing else. You know, we believe that the church is the church because it's the, the church that Christ established. And so we're Absolutely, following that yes. in the fullness of that. Yes. And I look back, one of your thoughts on, you were brought up in 
uh, these wonderful schools by the nuns. And you'd mentioned a little bit earlier that that, that sadly after Vatican II, were some of those uh, monastic movements are not providing those services anymore. No, I th- I'm, I'm very sad that these, uh, their charism was to teach, but some of them don't do that anymore. Or yeah. I think maybe that's why they don't get the, uh, perhaps, I don't know, the, 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 the uh, vocations either, because... Um, People like me have only good things to say. I, I, am, I, will, I pray for them to, to my dying day because I think they have done a fantastic job. And I don't think even Catholics are aware of what missionaries have done in mission countries. Well, I think maybe they learn now because now the, the, the stream has been reversed. Now they are mission people from my country and are, <laughs> are coming back to Europe which was really the, the, the source of missionary activity for so many centuries and now it's sadly it's no more the case and now we have uh, only in our own diocese we have priests from all over the world. That's right. Well in America, I mean I've, I've encountered many Indian yes. priests yes, yes, in America yes, yes, that they're yes. serving there. So we're paying back now for what we received. <laughs> but I, I think this, your, your story, your own conversion is a witness to the seeds planted by those Absolutely. wonderful nuns yes, that, yes, that yes, yes. maybe in their environment they couldn't catechize, but they delivered the faith through you their know, love imagine, and their mercy. Imagine a, a, a sister that from England coming from a temperate climate, coming to our part of the world, the heat, the dirt, the flies, the smells, the whatever, you, you know, you name it. And then to make it their home for the rest of their lives. Gosh, I wonder how many would do that. Yeah. It, it, it just and for what? For nothing but for the love of God. Mm-hmm. I mean, that well, is just such a it, well, that's um, similar, tremendous of course, thing. You mentioned from England, but then that's also the parallel to Mother Teresa's same. That, that's right. Yeah, or I'm, I'm just take them as but, an example. But I was also thinking that uh, again, Americans particularly who are also watching this show, we live in a country where we have really no concept of the caste mm. struggles that are in India. So you have the, the, the wonderful nuns and brothers coming to serve in yes. a system yes. Yes. and they're yes. treating everyone with Absolutely love. Absolutely. I went back to Pakistan last year with two of my grandchildren, two boys. They were then uh, 13 and 9 years old. And um, of course they were very shocked by the by Pakistan. They love the people because they're wonderful, very kind, very warm, and they had a great reception from everybody almost wherever they went. But the poverty, the dirt, the flies, this absolutely shocked them. Really, they didn't. And then I took them to, uh, I, I know an, uh, a Belgian nun who lives in the poorest section of town, and she's built a school there for a thousand children. They had two shifts. And in this absolute slum of a place, you go into the walls behind and it's like a little oasis. Clean, garden, it's just, it's so shocking that you can't believe it. My grandchildren, it was a fantastic experience for them to see that and to see what this lone Hmm. Western woman there Hmm. has been doing and has done there, Uh, it's just, it was mind-boggling for the for the It's boys. encouraging us, us yeah. to pray for those sisters and those orders that yeah. are probably struggling and they're for struggling there. Uh, for and, the and there's nothing, and they get no... Of course, they have a few Catholics, very poor Catholics. And in fact, they're moving in around that school because the education is so good there. Hmm. And um, the, these nuns, the, these missionaries, they are really absolutely... You'd mentioned also something to me where again outside of Indian culture we may not understand and that is for example when when you have um, those of the the lower caste who are treated and cared for by the sisters then they themselves become sisters yes uh, I, I, I discussed that with my, with my former um, school I went there and I was asking them how it was the St. Joseph's school in Karachi is was the elite school when I was growing up. Everybody wanted to send their children there. It is no longer that. And I asked them why, and they said, well, you know, there are no more European sisters coming. There are a few of them, they're very old there. And then, of course, I don't think Pakistan allows missionaries to come in anymore. I'm not quite sure on that. 
But anyway, so but these young girls that they have uh, trained and educated now, they're taking over these uh, teachers and uh, principals of the school. But unfortunately, they belong to the lower caste, the absolutely the, uh, the, the lowest caste. Yeah. And, and many of the ladies, you know, from these fine families, they find it very difficult to accept that these girls, although they're educated, and probably have all the degrees you can think of, but because they've come from the wrong caste or the wrong class, I don't know what it is. They, they, they In America we say the wrong side of the tracks. That's right, that's <laughs> right. Which is very, very sad. And, yes. and it is a, it, it, because they don't, they, that is one of the problems there. And, um, but uh, I think, you know, although in Muslim Pakistan, we don't have a caste system there, but because of the culture, yeah. you know, it, it, it is very much in... Uh, well, it helps us know how to pray for those people yes. in those cultures and the yes. struggles they have, yes. and yes. especially now in, in our world today when the issue of Islam and Christianity are, are, are confronting themselves in a way that maybe it's been almost... Uh, seven, eight hundred years since we've been confronted the way that we're confronting today mm. helps us understand to how we need to reach out in love and prayer mm. and mercy and uh, and recognize God's great love for everyone. We want them to know the fullness of the faith, but we do that in love. Yes, and that's yes, we were called yes, yes. to evangelize. Talat, thank you so much. Thank you so much. For joining us on the journey home, sharing your story with us, and our prayers are for you and your family. Thank you. Continued ministry. And thank you all for joining us on this special edition of The Journey Home from Stockholm Suite. God bless you. See you again soon.